So kudos to you folks as well. And I was asked yesterday, what's my favorite feature in Central Desktop? And I really had to think. Yeah. You don't get asked that every day. And I came back with why I think the FSG system won the award is it's such a flexible tool to use. And we got to mold that darn thing in so many different ways. And we're using it to support project teams, because we're a consulting firm, communities of practice, communities of interest, functional departments, social committees. You're going to see a couple of screenshots. We use it in, in a whole variety of different ways. But enough about that. So we're not here to talk about FSG, and we're not here to talk about how great the desktop is. We're here to talk about how we build a collaborative culture. And as I was looking at the title from the back of the room a few months, a few months, a few moments ago, I looked at myself, a lot of you, if not all of you, are probably thinking, really? Why is this even a topic? Why do we worry about such a thing? And the reason we may think that way is why we're all here today. We're all users of a tool that promotes collaboration. We are all probably at least 50% in our psyche pro-collaboration. We like it. We get it. We want others to do it. So why would we need to worry about whether or not others are going to do it? And, well, some of you, maybe all of you, may have learned the hard way it's because not everyone thinks like us. Not everyone thinks it's a good idea to collaborate. Not everyone likes to collaborate. And part of what I'll talk about is not every organization necessarily thinks collaboration is a good thing to do, in spite of what the marketing messages say, in spite of what the CEO says in his annual address. There's those underlying scenes in something that we're going to talk about called corporate culture that says, yeah, but you're really not supposed to share what you think around here especially if you don't agree with senior management. Attitudes like that will kill a culture. That's what we're going to talk about, is how do you dispel attitudes like that? How do you move an organization forward? But before that, um, all right, so this is working. We'll use the old-fashioned way. A little bit more about me. Because I always think it's important for an audience to know, well, why should I pay attention to the clown standing up in front of the room right now? Well, as Mark pointed out, to a certain degree, I'm one of you, right? I'm a user of Central Desktop, so I, I felt the pain. I've, I've enjoyed the rewards, but I've also felt the pains when bugs pop up, and so I get it. I know what the limitations and the strengths are. But also, I've been a consultant in the area of knowledge management, content management, and collaboration for so many years that I'm willing to bet I was doing it before some of you were even out of grade school. So, I. I I mention that because in this presentation I'm going to talk a lot about what I'm currently doing at FSG, but I can also use a lot of examples from organizations that I've worked with that have faced collaborative culture problems. Organizations like Pfizer, organizations like the AARP, organizations like uh, the USGSA agency. So a lot of history is going to come into this as well. That was on the slide. Now the other thing you should be aware of are, and it's a bit of an apology and a level set from the very beginning. For those who uh, sat through the presentation yesterday that Linda and Mark did in the What Kind of a Collaborator Are You, I'm an expert, which I hate that title because I think it carries all kinds of baggage with it, but what I wanted to point out is the downside of an expert, you pointed out yesterday, sometimes you come across as, what was the adjective you used? Condescending. Condescending. <laughs> There's something to be proud about. Um, so keep that in mind, and then keep in mind the fact that the last name points to the fact that I'm of Italian descent. How many of you are familiar with the website? I'm not screaming, I'm Italian, that's how I talk. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the members of my family have liked that website. So you take the fact that I'm an expert profile, the fact that I can get excited really easily when I'm talking, I might come across as condescending. That's not my intention, and I therefore ask you to ask me questions throughout. I, if I come across as uh, a pedantic and, and dictating to you, I want to speak at you, I want to speak with you. Challenge me, ask questions throughout. I've got, I don't know how many slides I have, quite a few. But I could boil my presentation down to three, and I'll point them out when I get there. So let's not worry about time. Like, oh my God, is there 14 more slides to get through? I'm going to get to at least three of them, and those three carry the real message of what's here. So feel free to interrupt at any time, challenge, interject your own war stories, 
I'd love to hear them, and I'm sure everyone else did, uh, would. And Mark already told you what FFG does, professional services company. But here's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to start very basic. That's how I kind of kicked off this talk. Why does culture even matter? Why do we care about it? And after years of study, I can show you why I think it's so important. But then we're going to talk about, well, how do I know what the organizational culture is? And I'll relate this a bit to the, um, the nine types of collaborators, because that's very similar to the way you assess an organization's culture. The collaborators is much more granular. It's how is an individual's personal approach to collaboration. But communities together will bring forth a culture. How do you appreciate what's going on in that culture? And then how do you leverage some of the personality types you have in the culture that you have? But if you don't know what kind of culture you have, is shooting in the dark. So we're going to look at, well, how can I assess that culture and how do I figure out how cultures align with technology? Then I'll, I'll give you the laundry list of some of the bigger, not all, the bigger challenges people face when they try to manage a culture, and then the benefit of 25 some odd years in the industry and what seems to work in motivating people to get more and more collaborative when they're not in the mood to do so, and what works in getting people to uh, approach it through a technology platform when they don't necessarily like doing it that way. And then, as I said, Q&A built in throughout. So why does culture matter? Slide one. But this is the only slide I can talk about today. That, this is the one I picked. Now, it's labeled knowledge management. Because when I created this slide so many years ago, that was the focus of the day. And I didn't want to change it. I wanted to stay true to where the slide came from. But knowledge management is a very broad topic. So substitute your own word. Substitute collaboration. Substitute E2O. Call it what you will. When you're trying to bring people together so that they collectively leverage what they know to expedite decision making, and your role is to build an ecosystem to make that happen as effectively and as efficiently as possible, then this is your job. You sit right here in the middle of all of this. Your job is to assess what is the goal what are the strategies that drive this community or business organization? Why do we exist? What do we want to achieve? Now, you don't necessarily define that strategy, but you damn well better appreciate it and understand it. Similarly, what are, what's the community like? How do we motivate our people? What are our people all about? What do they think about one another? This is a lot of touchy-feely stuff. Again, you may not be a member of HR. You may not be on the social committee, but you damn well better get a finger on what's going on over there. What are the processes like in this organization? How do we run day to day? Are the processes aligned with knowledge capture, or do they actually flow against knowledge capture? You know, in the company I'm in right now, which has a marvelous culture, I was blessed with the culture I walked in on, though so not perfect, and we'll talk about that. But Here's one of the reasons it wasn't perfect. They're so pro-knowledge and collaboration, they really are. There were no processes in place for somebody on a project team to impart what they just learned on this project. There was no tagging going on until I got there. So somebody would say, well, have we ever worked on a project with GE? I don't know. But what? Really? We don't know? Well, see, they did know. They knew up here. I'll talk a little bit more about that and how cultures had to change because they were relying a lot on their human memory and that worked for 10 years and then it started to crack. And that's when they said, maybe it's time to bring in more formal processes and technology and your central desktop. Now, you don't have to be a process expert. You don't have to come out of IT. Just out of curiosity, how many of you sit in IT? All right. Not very many. Because it's not about technology. Again, it's about all of this. Now, hopefully you're well-footed in at least one of these areas. But your real talent has to be in orchestrating, aligning, and appreciating how they work together and not against one another. If you're not an expert in process, you better find an ally who is. If you're not an expert in IT, you better get some people in the IT to who are going to support you. If you're not a member of the executive team, you better find allies who are. You've got to get well familiar with all of this. And then, as I said, your job is to orchestrate this. If it's starting to sound like a lot of work, yeah, it is. It's a pain in the butt. You've got to like doing this stuff. 
Because you're going to get curveballs from all four of those angles, right? Oh, our business strategy just changed. We're inventing a new product. We want to go in a different direction. Oh, great. Because that's probably going to change a lot of what you've done today. IT says, well, you know, we're no longer going to be a, uh, a Microsoft shop. We're going all Mac. Oh, wonderful. So the system I bought is going to have to be completely ported over to a different platform. So you get the point, right? You don't dictate this. You are aligning with it and making it all happen. Now, among these, I said earlier, culture is the most important one to pay attention to. They are all absolutely important because they play off of one another. But this is the slippery little eel in all of them. Business strategy is probably the most important. You really have to know where the company wants to go. But then this is the one that's so sublime sometimes you have to peek under the cover and say, but what's really going on? Because this is the collective people. And people can reflect the business strategy. They can rally behind it. And if it's a healthy business strategy that promotes collaboration, that's good. But don't assume that that will happen because culture can also blind the strategy or turn a blind eye to strategy. My example here is in working with one of the biggest lobbying groups down in Washington, D.C., and I will allow them to remain anonymous, but this is not something they're proud of. Their business strategy was to build their membership they were a membership organization that then lobbied the government for the rights of the people they were representing. They were all gung ho about it, but their knowledge management and collaboration, pardon my language, sucked. It sucked. And one of the reasons was when we got in there, in fact, when I was a consultant, we figured out that the underlying culture was not very cooperative. They all shook hands in the hallway, they all got along around the board of directors table, but they were all fighting for their bit of the budget. Every department talked about silos. I asked a question when I was interviewing some of these people. I said, what would happen if somebody from another department came in and said, what are you working on? I said, what I heard? My first response would be, why do you need to know? This is not a collaborative environment, <laughs> right? Getting back to what Linda and Mark were talking about yesterday, you know, this is the, the new employee who, when the, the ninja stealth starts commenting on their work, thinks, why are you looking at what I'm doing? So there's an underlying culture there that's going on that can really say, great strategy, we're not in support of it. Culture, very, very important. Culture can drive process. This is a lot of what was going on at FSG two some odd years ago. The culture there was so right, so open and warm and fuzzy. I mean, FSG is all about solving social problems. We're trying to solve world hunger and educational rights around the world, etc. So you can imagine that the underlying culture of the people that work there are very cooperative. They want to see FSG succeed in the worst of ways. So in spite of the fact that there were no formal processes around, people invented their own, so to speak. They went the extra mile to try to communicate to one another. There were literally thousands of emails being sent amongst 90 employees every day because that was the way they were trying to drive knowledge sharing with their own process. People can also derail process if they don't like what's going on, right? So that's the other thing you want to watch out for is the culture is not one that wants to be collaborative and you put in place processes to help you share what you know. Don't underestimate the power Matt is saying, yes, I'm not doing that. Try to get people to tag their content when they're entering it. That alone is tough. Now try to get them to do it honestly and effectively. That's even tougher. But try working with a group of doctors, a group of tell lawyers they need to tag their content. They will literally laugh. That's not what I'm paid to do, I can tell them. That's not what I'm paid to do. But I did. Yeah, I think you get the point. This is my favorite, especially given the fact that we're here in Tech Topics. Yeah? Can you turn your microphone on to the air conditioning? I'm sorry, I thought it was on. Okay, now it is. <laughs> Woo! So nobody heard anything I just said, should I go back ten slides? <laughs> All right. This one, given that we're here at the Central Desktop Technology Conference, also the most important to talk about right now, culture can leverage technology. This is partially what I walked into an FSG. So there was a culture that was very into the idea of being collaborative and sharing what they knew. 
to advance social causes. So if you threw the right, we're going to talk about right, if you threw the right technology at it, they would embrace it and grow with it. But our culture can also sabotage technology. And this is the old, you know, field of change thing. Well, if you build it, they'll come. If you build it, they can ignore it. In the worst case scenario, they'll sabotage it. They'll constantly point out to business executives why the tool's broken, how it's making their life miserable, how it's making them slower. That's easy to deal with because at least it's overt. The hard one is when they're sabotaging it underwater. They just ignore it. Oh, I forgot to do that. I don't like it. Now, this is what the downside of FSG was. People will not be forced to do anything. We're a very entrepreneurial corporate culture, so everyone figures out the best way for them to work. So when I walked in, I wasn't allowed to say we are all going to use central desktop now. The attitude was more of a, we all should be, and here's the good reason why we should be. So it would be nice if you did. Till this day, there are some people who aren't using it, and it's not even deliberate. It's, I haven't gotten 100% buy in to this yet. But it's not deliberate. It's something we're going to talk about in more detail. It's habit that you have to break. This company went 10 years without using any technology like this. Try to tell a busy executive who is on a plane half of his life, responsible for a multi-million dollar budget, you forgot to tag your content. So when you stick it, leave me alone. That's going to be the attitude, right? It would be much more effective if when you were on a project team, you put all your comments on the bulletin board. You've got to let that go sometimes. So we'll talk more about that. But these four reasons are why culture is so important and why we're going to talk about it. It's the hardest one to control. Right? You can buy technology, you can define a process, you can sit around a board table and put a strategy together, but it's a lot harder to hurt cats. And that's what culture is all about. And so you really have to watch it and very finely maneuver it. You can't dictate changes in culture. If only that would be the case, that would be wonderful. So, how do you know what your culture looks like? Well, before the how, let me show you how you might measure it or what um, types of culture you might run into. And this is a slide that dates back to um, uh, consulting days when I had to start teaching people how you roll Enterprise 2.0 into an organization. And I used to make the point, you have to understand where your organization is and how right they are to start doing web-based collaborative thinking. So we're going to go through all of these, but before I get into it, I wanted to point out a few things. Number one, um, you know, for the reasons of being able to explain what they are, I'm going to be very siloed. Very, very rarely are you going to find out that we're all island of me, or we're all proactive of me. You're kind of going for a blend very often. So for example, when um, I started with FSG, they were kind of in here. They were in between one-way me and team me. And they also have some very strong evidence of a culture that was in two-way thing. And that's okay, because I was just aware of, okay, that's what I'm working with right now. I've got a little bit of this and a lot of those two. And that's what you're going to want to do if you don't already have a handle on this, is to figure out what culture am I walking into, which is very different than the nine types of collaborators. As I said, that's a level down now. Within that culture, what kind of workers do I have? The other thing that you're going to want to keep a handle on is where are we technically? So in the organization today, are my users comfortable with 1.0 technology, 1.5 technology, or 2.0 technology? And the reason I point that is a lot of people often ask, can you change culture through technology? It can help. It's not a very strong weapon. The point I'm trying to make is if you find out that your organization is sitting back here at 1.0 culturally, and you found a tool that could propel them into the extended me world, I wouldn't buy that tool. Not unless you could roll it out in very small stages because if people will go into a dizzy spell. You're pushing them away too quickly. Just because the technology is there doesn't mean they're suddenly going to adapt it and use it the way it was meant to be used. They've got to go slowly, unfortunately. Now, if you find that your people are here, but technology is here, you can introduce perhaps some very advanced technologies and culturally they're ready for it and you can jump right into it. That's sort of what was happening at FSG. Our culture was way ahead of our technology. Um, and then I just wanted to point out, so where's F uh, Central Desktop in there? I would position Central Desktop probably right in here. They're in between 1.5 and 
So they're not a full web-based social collaborative environment, but they certainly have a lot of functionality there. So that's why I say they're a little more than a 1.5, but they're not a 2.0, which was perfect for what I was trying to achieve at FSG. So what are these all about? Well, the islands of me, I kind of call this the PC generation. These are people who really love their personal computer. This is an organization that uh, is all about protectionism. It's my content. The word my is used a lot. It's my application. It's my content. It's my document. My God, people, they're not a community here. Um, these exist. These definitely still exist. The lobbying group I talked about earlier, this is heavily rooted in their organization. Typically, these are organizations that view their products or services as not having a lot of competition, so they, they don't look at aggressive needs for change and development because products have very long uh, life cycle or shelf life, so they don't feel a need to collaborate very often and build things very quickly. In these organizations, if technology is aligned with their culture, you're going to find a lot of silo repositories and standalone applications. Technology that doesn't talk to one another, databases that don't talk to one another, databases repositories that are owned, I hate that word, by individuals. Um, that's what this one's all about. As I said, this is where FSG was to a very large degree when I got there. Uh, and again, very healthy culture for collaboration, so you don't have to be way at the right end. You can be starting back here. But one way me Enterprise 1.0, meaning there is a need to collaborate. I get it. I value the opinions and work products of my coworkers. But it's all one-way push. I'll share with you when I'm ready to share and or when you specifically ask me for something. That's the as-needed knowledge seeking. So there was no infrastructure or inclination to say, I always want to be aware. But when I need to know, I'll ask and probably somebody's going to push something to me. It's not a horrible place to be, but the downside to this obviously is I just pushed it to you. What a shame that you didn't get to see that too, isn't it? Because until you ask me, you're never going to say it. Or you ask Linda, then she'll share it with you. So it can be limiting, but there's something to work with here. Um, shared yet silo repository. So the repositories are perhaps public folders, but they're very siloed. And that was very much what was going on at FSG from a technology standpoint. Their, their only approach to online collaboration was a shared drive that was created in a bunch of folders and nobody understood what the folder labels were. It was, it was not a happy place as far as technology went. Very little automated workflow going on. Now a step up from that, and we have a bunch of people living in this world as well as the team me, and now we're really starting to get into a culture that begins to appreciate well, what is knowledge management and what is collaboration really all about. We tend to think in teams. The word I goes away, there's a lot more we, there's still maybe ownership, but it's very much at the team level. This is kind of the birth of knowledge management as an industry, is it the collective thing that's really so important, and this permeates the culture of an organization. There are communities, there are teams in organizations like this. Repositories are definitely shared, they're considered a corporate asset, they're promoted as a tool that people should be using. We begin to introduce intranets and extranets, and interestingly enough, this is how we got started at FSG, the only corporate intranet. And I think, in retrospect, I just thought of this. I think it was because instinctively I saw this culture and thought, well, this is going to fit really well. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Proactive Me or Enterprise 1.5, this is a lot. Um, like a one-way me, except now it's multi-directional. So the content is constantly being pushed out in such a way that anyone can pull it on an as-needed basis. It's not a one-to-one -one sharing, it's a one-to-many and many-to-many -many sharing. And that this is the way people think about what they do for a living and the way they share what they do for a living. This is a culture that is absolutely right for a tool like Central Delta. It's all team-oriented, it's all collective thinking, that's what this culture is all about. There's semi-automatic collaboration, meaning um, there may not necessarily be a reliance on technology yet to say you and I are going to collaborate. We still may rely a lot on telephones and things like that, and there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. This is, that's where the mindset of that organization is right now. Here we start getting into uh, technologies 
that best support 1.5 will be very dynamic, personalized pages. So yesterday I had a smile when I saw the new approach to dashboards that are going to be rolled out. And I'm not going to sugarcoat this. I'm not ecstatic. I'm not doing back clips, but you guys are moving in the right direction for supporting this and that. The dashboards now can be role-based. I'd like to see them personally based, but they can be role-based. So at least now I can say there's not one way to look at our knowledge. There's many ways to look at our knowledge. And depending on who you are and what you're doing, that's dynamic, personalized web pages. Now, at the absolute cutting edge, you'll see tools out there that cost millions of dollars that will actually figure out not just who you are, but what you're working on right now and filter the way content is going to be fed to you. That's very much cutting edge. And we're starting to get into the cutting edge, not only in technology, but also in culture. The two-way made, very proactive community building, communities of practice, communities of interest are driven proactively in these organizations. So it's not just getting the job done, but it's also we live in communities to discuss certain things. We are collaborative daily. It is written, it, it is implied rather in our job descriptions that we need to participate in these. In FSG, it's actually written, this is where I said they have a little bit of this going on. It's actually written in the job description that you've got to participate in at least two communities of practice in our organization. Again, they had this idea that we have to work together, but technically that's what was pulling them way back in another direction. Uh, organizations that are into this type of an approach to culture are also technically starting to get the idea that cloud-based is not something to be feared. Open source technology is not something to be feared. Social networking starts to become something that is embraced because you're recognizing that it's not necessarily what you know but who you know that's really important. And so you want technology that's going to allow you to promote, facilitate the networking of people together and to then be able to analyze what networks do we have and how do we leverage them. And then there's the islands of we and now we're really on the cutting edge. Social is what this organization is all about. There are very few of these that exist today. This is a culture that says, really, collaboration is what we do. By the way, there's a work product at the end of the day. These are organizations that are very, very open and transparent, that bring external partners, customers, competitors into their knowledge system. This is something that FSG is going to start experimenting with, sort of. We're not going to let the competitors in yet, but a lot of partners, a lot of customers, I can't talk about this project because we haven't released it yet, but we're starting to embrace it. Interesting side note, when we first um, deployed Central Desktop, I didn't buy any external licenses. I kind of knew the culture was not going to want anyone outside. Today we have 46 external, no, 49, I think, external licenses. They're all being used. I paid for 50, so Larry, in a few more days, I'll probably be calling you to get more. The idea here is something that I'll wrap this talk uh, on, is people are going to change. You've got to move them slowly. So day one, they went, there's no way in the heck we're going to let an external people into our project site. And then when they saw what a project site really was and how they can leverage it, some of my more forward-thinking case team leaders said, yeah, I can see letting that other consultant in. I can see letting the customer in. And then we got into the internal folders and customer-only folders, and that really eased a lot of the anxiety they had. So very much cutting edge. Um, not a whole lot of people doing this. When you are getting into this, then you're going to find tools that are just all about each of them. And it's all about being open and transparent and commenting on everything. And, you know, again. Anybody have a culture like that? Alright. If anyone ever does, I'd love to hear about it. And then the absolute absolute is the full enterprise 2.0, and this is just what I was talking about on Stella. This takes real business strategy leadership to say we do not fear our competitors, we embrace our competitors. That's all I want to say about this, because we're starting to get to a point where none of you are dealing with this right now, which is why I just asked that question. So, wrapping up, what is this really all about? It's about, as I said, you've got to figure out where are you, if you haven't already, and how do I align a technology that's just right, that's going to fit hand in glove, to support where we are and perhaps pull us ahead a little, if we're ready for it, depending again on where our culture is. Now, the question probably is, well, how do I do that? This is 
the point in the presentation where if I was still a consultant, I would sell you on a tool that I developed called Pam Square. I don't do that anymore. I can't sell it to you anymore, so there's no hard selling it. But the point being, I, you know, there's a lot of ways. Go find one that works for you. Talk to HR. Interview the community. Get an outsider to come in and interview your community. Take the, what type of collaborators do we have in this organization tech? Now, with all due respect, it's not a way powerful tool. It's a good start. And then do what Linda did. Do the pie chart. So how many ninjas do we have? And how many skeptics do we have? You begin to appreciate what's the community, not the individual that I'm dealing with. How am I going to deal with the fact that when I roll something out, 90% of them are going to say, I don't want to use this. Versus 90% of them are going to say, I want to be social with this. Ugh. Either one of those is a good place to be, right? So that's that. That's all I wanted to say on that. Any questions? Okay. So identifying the challenges. I wanted to start with this one. And maybe I don't need to, but I like to always remind people. Web 2 up. what's going on on the social internet is minimally relevant to what goes on in the enterprise social net for so many reasons. There's, this manifests in so many ways. The one that's currently bothering me, we've got a project going on right now where we're trying to bring uh, an enhanced search tool into the central desktop environment. And all I hear from my users is, well, why don't we just buy Google? Why don't we just buy Google? And it's like, well, we might buy Google but don't expect it to work the way it does on the internet every day that way in our behind the firewall environment. It wasn't built for that. It's not massaged and, and, and made to do that. That's just one example. The other one is, I, I'm not making this up, I actually had somebody say to me a few months ago, we want to build a, a, a video that will go viral. Okay, you know. How many of you know Charlie Bitney? Charlie Bitney. And that went viral. Really? Is that what we want to do? <laughs> and, and granted, this is not my area of expertise. There are people who could probably say we could take a social impact and cause video and get it to go as viral as possible. There are techniques for doing that. But why? Why would we want to do that? And by the way, folks, in FSG, it's not a matter of just getting it on YouTube and making it funny. It's not that easy. Why isn't it that easy? Well, scale, numbers. We're talking about the World Wide Web. It's not even worth trying to say, well, how many gigabytes of information are out there? How many users are there in Facebook? A crap load, that's how many. So if you get one percentage of them, you can start building the momentum. Get one percent of a 100 user organization like mine, and you got one person. That's not momentum, right? So that's why you've got to say, no, 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 we're not going to approach it like Web 2.0. It's not about that. You actually do have to control what's going on by aligning business strategy, property, technology, etc. All right, not profitizing. What do you really need to get your hands on? This is, you know, the culture is how you kind of rank yourself, but these are the things you really want to know. Where is the inclination in your organization? Are users inclined? Are they inquisitive? Do they like to learn or do they like to do things by rote? Are they comfortable knowing what their job is and being able to do it every day blindfolded? There's a lot of people like that out there and there's no problem with that. Every organization needs a little of that, I think. If you've got a lot of that, you've got a culture that you're going to have to want to change. Because we don't want to learn. Perceived value. Where do people see the jewels in the organization in Knowledge, collaboration, and each other. So are there pieces of information, knowledge, experiences, that are more valuable than others? Guess where you're going to spend your initial time building your knowledge repository, right? Where are the jewels? Is it the proposals we write or the deliverables that we provide? Is it the thought pieces that we create or is it the customer complaint letters that we get? What do you want? What do you most value? If it's none of it, well, then you've got a really big problem on your hands. These kind of go hand in hand. Do they value each other? Do they value collaboration? Do you have a community that really thinks it's a good idea to not just jump to a conclusion, but to get multiple people's input in on it? Because if that's not there, you've got a culture you've got to fight against. The next one's reflective of this. How do they value each other? This is where your job can get really sticky. This is political. 
right? Do, do, do these people like one another? Do they respect one another? If Carl says X and John says Y, do you immediately assume that John's you know, right? Carl's just an idiot? <laughs> that can be going on. So you definitely want to get a handle on do they value equally across the board? Or do they put different values on different roles, different office locations? I've seen this in quite a few organizations. Well, if you're in the sandwich office, you're important. But if you're in the Connecticut office, you're a piece of crap. How do you fight that? Because that's not conducive to collaboration. Or at least say, well, then let's start with collaborating in sandwich. Because that seems to be a healthy place right now. And then try to move the Connecticut people into here and figure out why that exists. And we'll talk more about that. The trust factor, this is going to be used. This is one of the... I already did slide one, this is slide two where we get to trust. Trust is absolutely, absolutely important. So that's all I'll say about it now because we've got a whole slide on it. Level of techno geekiness. You've got to assess this. This was so important to me at FSG. I knew I couldn't throw a lot of technology at these people very quickly. The overwhelming majority of them think that email is hot shit. <laughs> And they like it because they've been using it for many, many years. <laughs> I brought up the word Twitter once, and somebody called me, somebody said, see that Twitch shit. <laughs> oh! <laughs> and they weren't being mean, it was, that was just their attitude. So you really got to get a sense for when you show them new technologies, are they going to say, yeah, or are they going to go, <sighs> And I had a lot of these, a lot. I had a couple of these, and we're going to talk about what you do when you only have a few of these people. One of them is a regular pain in the butt, because no matter what I roll out, his very first question is, can I get it on my iPhone? <laughs> <laughs> and he's the only one who asked. I was like, I can't do that just for you. I can't do that just to worry about. And then habitual tendency and inertia, I kind of mentioned that as well with um, FSG. That is the one we've always done it this way. Till this day, we're now a year and a half into this, and we're, you know, we won an award, not to brag, but we did. It, it's going well, and yet till this day, just two weeks ago, I had to remind one of the managing directors that he posted his leadership paper through email. Why didn't you stick it into Frank? That's what we call our central desktop system. Why didn't you stick it into Frank? I forgot. Oh, God. <laughs> so, you're going to have to deal with that too. How do you deal with that? Here's how you're going to deal with it. Here's the list, let's go through them. Remember, there's no I in collaborate. No one owns collaboration. That's one of the biggest things I had to do just last week when we won the award. People like, oh, Carl, congratulations. I was like, no, congratulations to you. I didn't build this. You built this. I threw tools at you, and you built this. We won this. Nobody owns collaboration. Don't let anyone say that they're not a part of it. They are all a part of it. Even the lack of you are a part of it. We embrace you part of our community. Start top down and bottom up. You've got to get sponsorship from the top. That's a clear sign that you're going to be successful. When senior level management is saying, we see this is very important, and I'll talk about how you can leverage that for a little while. But then also bottom up, you've got to figure out, well, who are the champions who are going to embrace this right away to get your early adopters going in there. Buy in on vision from the very beginning. So even before we bought Central Desktop, I had many slides that showed what our system was going to look like. They were very high level. But there was a lot of value statement going on. This is what we're going to achieve. Do we think we are moving in the right direction? No, then let's backpack. And then once you get an overwhelming majority of people saying, I like that, well, now they've got skin in the game. Now we start to get that weight. I, first of all, this is a true story. I did not select Central Desktop. A team of 15 people did. I threw three products at them. So I narrowed it down and said, which one would you most want to work with? So now when they bellyate, when bugs pop up, I always say, well, I didn't pick it, you did. <laughs> <laughs> you've got to do this on a daily basis now. As I said a little bit earlier, this is hard work. You've got to be willing to embrace this. This is not an easy job to own, to, to own communities and support their collaboration. I almost said, oh, shame on me. Team and community engagement. It's constantly about getting the community engaged in whatever way you can. There's another slide coming up that shows how we did it with certain bulletin boards and stuff like that. But this one was in a very soft way. So I want to talk about this with, with um, all three of these at once. So team engagement, empower early adopters uh, that are good collaborators, and give collaboration a sign. 
So I talked about the community engagement on a daily basis. Start to figure out who are the ones on their iPhones, who are the ones that want to collaborate, who are the ones that figured out pretty darn quickly why this was such a powerful tool that we were rolling out, and get them on your team. Even if they've got invisible dotted lines to you, you get them on your team, and you get them to start proselytizing why this is such a good idea. Every time they do something good, write a blog post about it, point to it, announce it, clap every time they walk down the hallway. They're going to believe those people more than you because they're the peers, right? So if you find, in my case, a consultant who is understanding collaboration and using the tool well, I make them here all day. The next thing, though, is to give collaboration a persona. So as I mentioned earlier, Central Desktop is called Frank in our organization. Frank stands for FSG's really awesome metric of knowledge. I did not name it. That was also a team effort. We had a contest. It was fun. I opened it up to 100 people and said, we need to name this thing. You don't want to call it Central Desktop because it's not about the technology, right? It's not. So let's get the technology name out of here. Somebody else came up with Frank. We voted. Lo and behold, there we are. But that wasn't the end of it. See, Frank, the reason why you want a persona is now a member of the team. Which is why I was really hoping we came up with a human name for this thing. Because there are actually people now who will say things like, well, have you asked Frank yet? <laughs> is Frank coming to the meeting? That was really good. So, it really helped, as silly as it sounds, it can really help to do that and talk about silly. Why are these pictures here? So, in... June of this year, Frank was a year old. All six officers had a birthday party. And they all took a picture and posted it to Frank around the world, including my favorite. We have a team of one person in India, and she had a very local dessert. I forget the name of it. I couldn't even pronounce it when I saw it. And took a picture of that. But Frank is international. Frank was enjoyed in India. Silly, you bet you don't want to go Get your allies to help? I sure did, because this is the Boston office, and you'll notice I'm not in the picture. I was very uncomfortable doing this. This is not, this does not come natural to me, having a birthday party. It's just thing. And when they asked me to give a speech, I thought I was going to die. I have nothing to say. But look at all these geeks out there. They're like, yeah, Frank! And they bought into it. So, you know, find those people who are going to help you do this. And so look at their support and, and rally behind the fact that collaboration is an entity. It's not something we do. It's a presence here. Now, a bit more practical. This is the stuff I like to do, not birthday parties. Is Show me the money. Create sites that are going to drive community feel and drive usage. So here's our website. Uh, this is our intranet. Here on this page, it's a portal jumping off page, so the tabs are really important. You've got your department, your communities of practice, your approach area, the corporate library, blah, 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 blah. All of those are a tab away. Why, you know, why isn't something on the front page? I mean, search for our engagements is that red button up at the top. Why aren't the engagements front and center? That's why we bought this tool. Primarily, it was because every time we do a project, so much knowledge comes out of it. We need to share that. Yeah, but if I had just posted that, usage wouldn't have really happened. But collaboration needs to be driven for two reasons. They were collaborative by nature, but they were not going to use technology necessarily. So I had to get them starting to use technology. And I had to make it about more than just business. Because these are very warm and fuzzy people. So if you look at what's going on on the website is, one of the problems FSG was experiencing when I talked about, you know, the old approach to collaboration was we just remember everything. Well, that was back in the day when we had one office, but then we had two, and then we had four, and now we have six. We had one employee, five employees, and now we broke a hundred. We can't remember everything. We hire people in San Francisco. We know that we hire them. We do this, ooh, our announcement. But I'm in Boston. If I don't travel over there, I'm never really going to get to know them. Well, now we do. Because every week we post somebody's picture that works in the organization, and we do this five minutes left, from the very top down to the very bottom, and we post a bio, not about their professional background, that's somewhere else that we got. Who are they as a person? What do they like to eat? What are their hobbies? What are their pet peeves? Things like, what would they like as a child? This has become a very popular feature in a social organization like mine. They all love it. Pictures, very important. I've had people with some comments tell me pictures are a waste of time, they chill storage. 
Pictures are very personal. You want to drive collaboration? These can really help arrange it. You need to be recognized, not the message, but who is it. And I have faith in that person. I'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Here are our bulletin boards speaking frankly in the FSG water cooler. This is business stuff. This is where that MD was supposed to post his leadership paper and he forgot. But we're getting there. And what I'm really happy though is not only are we getting good at posting, almost all of them get comments now. So we're getting deliberate about collaborating. And it's not even on projects. And then here is the social side. So this is why it's also fun to come into Frank, because I can post pictures of my children's birthday party, because we do like to know that. But the beauty of this is, if I don't want to know that, I don't need to go there. And there are some people in FSG who maybe once a month look at the water cooler. And this is why it's so much different than pushing your status right now. I have a turkey sandwich today. I don't really care. <laughs> But if you put it there, and I do care what you ate, I might comment on it. So. <laughs> Trust. Slide two that's really important. But this one's so, so important. This is the one thing you've got to make sure you have. People have to have trust in their community. That if I make a mistake, you're not all going to laugh at me. That collaborating is really what you want me to do. There better be incentives and processes coming from the top down that enforce the fact that collaboration is really important. You've got to make collaboration something that is fully ingrained in the way people work. It's not extra work for them. Now, this is very different than finding the early adopters and leveraging them. Get your big kahunas out there and force them to use this tool if they really want to see it work. So, yes, I do periodically go to our two founders, our Anna and Isaac, and say to them, can you just post something in the blog, please? Can you comment that? Because when people see that those two are using this tool, that speaks louder than anything that, damn, we're serious about using this, aren't we? The other day, I, ha I had a message all ready to go about why it was important to archive the project sites within 30 days. And before I hit the send button, I thought, kind of stupid coming to me, isn't it? No one's going to listen to me. I asked John, one of our co-founders, I said, here's an email, can you send this? And he said, sure. Our archival rate went from 47% to 79% in a matter of weeks. That wasn't the message, it was the messenger that made that happen. Anybody know what just happened to you? Uh, the other two things that they have to have trust in is the system itself. Every time a bug arises, I want to cry. I just want to cry. You've got to manage that and very carefully. You've got to assure them that these things will be solved. They're just bumps in the road. If you make people's lives harder, then they lose faith in the system itself. Remember um, Noah yesterday from PBS and he said the woman who said to him, I don't like storing my files online. I like them in paper. When I heard that, I thought to myself, I think that's because, well, I never met the woman, she doesn't trust systems yet. Right? That, that vaporware out there, the paper, are very secure with it. That's faith in the system and then faith in the content. So if it only takes one time that somebody said, well, I found precedent, this is what we did, and then they learn, no, that wasn't the latest version of the document, that's not what we did. They have no trust in that library anymore. Trust, extremely, extremely important. I'm not a very detail-oriented person, that's why I have other people helping me with this. I don't want anything that's not perfect going into here. System can be imperfect. This is the third most important slide, because I'm running out of time, it's really good. Um, what should you be doing? It's the ABCs. You know, in sales, they say that's always be closing. Well, in nurturing collaborations, always be closing, caring, campaigning. This is why the job's so difficult. You always have to be selling the system. You always have to be listening to people and why they don't want to use the system. And you always have to be raw, raw cheerleading the system on an ongoing basis. You're wearing free hats all day long. But if you don't do it, Things aren't going to change. Even if you have a really healthy culture but you want to take them to healthier, you've got to get involved with them. You just absolutely have to. I could do 20 minutes on that alone and I'm running out of time. Sorry. Because I didn't want to forget this. This looks pretty easy. You just fall sometimes. Remember, I said there's no I collaborate and speak it. Right? Whenever you write anything about collaborating, it's not I. I am rolling out. I built. It's we. We, we. I now have a step point five that correctly reports to me. So now it doesn't look like I'm nuts when I write a memo that says we. But from day one, I always wrote we. You know, what do people think when they read those? Who's we? When you have a house in the pocket, you know? But it was important. It's absolutely important to get people to understand that. And then the other thing is don't oversell. So, you know, 
It's not about technology. It is about collaboration. And the worst thing you can do is say, we're a highly collaborative environment, and that's why we have to use Section Desktop, or in my case, break all the time. It's no, this is a tool that we can use to make our lives easier, to support us when we spread out around the world. But, folks, I am not trying to tell you that this is a way now that we don't have to talk to one another. I actually had people in the very beginning who were afraid that's what my messaging was all about. Well, do you want us to stop calling one another? No, absolutely not. We should still be mentoring one another, engaging with one another. Brown bag lunches are a wonderful thing to have. Get speakers from another office coming in, all wonderful things to have. That doesn't mean that you can't augment that with a platform like Central Desktop. Mark, I believe it was, said something yesterday. Be patient with your users and getting them to change. It's kind of what this slide is saying. You will not change cultures overnight. It's not about revolution, it's about evolution. You're going to pull them along slowly. Know where you want to get them, and just every day make sure you're taking an inch there. How are we on time? Because that's the end of it. Questions? We have two minutes. Yeah. How does, from your experience, your typical collaborative structure mm -hmm. influence the usual uh, job hierarchy um, uh, description of the organization? Yeah. Um, so, so the question was, how does a, a hierarchy in an organization influence collaboration? Or vice versa. Or vice versa. That really goes back to trust, right? And buying in from the top. Um, if your organization is very hierarchical and the culture recognizes that, and, you know, I would never talk to somebody two levels up from me without going through my boss and their boss first, then you're not a very collaborative organization. And you may want to get there, but you're going to have to start moving slowly because people recognize that hierarchy exists. It flattens the structure. It flattens the structure from a communication and collaboration standpoint, yes, most definitely. It doesn't mean that authority goes away. It doesn't mean that you don't have a CFO and a CEO anymore. Clearly, they are still there. If they want to throw down the gauntlet and say, thank you all for your input, but we're going to do this, well, that's okay as long as they're sincere about it. But if they, you know, solicit a lot of opinions and it's obvious they didn't listen to a single one of them, and then they just do what they want to do, I'd find another job if somebody said you need to be the collaboration expert around here. Um, but that certainly... One thing I want to say, and then the other one would be, if you could get in a hierarchy like that, some people at the top. Well, this happened at the Federal Reserve Bank when I was working there. Um, they were getting into blogs and discussion boards, and they were marginally successful. And then I forget the title, but somebody way at the top commented on one of the posts, changed the entire environment. But, like I said earlier, wow, if he's participating, we're serious about this. Is that a, that's it? One more? Is there one more? All right, thank you.